Hi, everybody. Welcome to the last lecture in international politics for the semester. Um, so today's topic is biosecurity. Since it's the last class, I'm not going to make it uh, overly long because I know that everyone's really busy. So we're just going to go over a little bit about how biosecurity is becoming an increasingly important issue, um, given that uh, this lecture has been recorded in the uh, middle of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I'm probably not going to take you too much convincing or probably not going to take very much convincing um, that biosecurity is um, a pretty important topic. Uh, so we're just going to look a little bit about kind of what are the threats, what are kind of the sources of threats, um, and, uh, and then we'll call it, uh, call it a day. All right, so how did uh, we get the rise of biosecurity as a, as a concept? Um, because like when we were talking about uh, with environmental security um, last time, uh, secu you know, security formally was restricted just to kind of uh, the military realm. So the issue of biosecurity, yes, biological weapons would be considered a military topic. So in that sense, biosecurity um, existed. But the kind of the wider concept of biosecurity is, as you know, as part of security um, it is a relatively new addition. Um, so the rise of health issues as a key topic in international security was enabled by a growing acceptance among national governments and international organizations of a definition of security beyond external military threats posed by security, right, as posed by states. So it kind of, many of these um, grew at, at, at the same time, the concepts of human security, environmental security, biosecurity, or health security. Um, many of them came in in the 1990s as just there was less and less acceptance uh, that mil military security um, was really, um, or focus on uh, military threats was doing a, a good enough job of describing all the different uh, threats that uh, people were facing or that states or people were facing. Uh, so what changes made uh, this possible? Uh, so we had, uh, uh, non-military threats, so the redefinition of security to include non-military threats such as environmental degradation, climate change, organized crime, uh, refugee flows, and, and terrorism, right? So as we saw a growing uh, num array of non-military threats, it became increasingly uh, important to, you know, have a way to discuss these threats within the confines of kind of the, the security discourse, right? As threats to states, you know, in, in the past, the dominant threats the states were largely military. Um, uh, you know, uh, there certainly were some environmental and definitely human security. Maybe you can make an argument should have been there. Um, but uh, in, in the era, era, particularly the Cold War, we were very, very focused on kind of traditional uh, state security. Um, but as time went on, more and more non-military threats began, began to emerge the rights of non-state actors. So we need to eventually acknowledge that the source of these threats are prom primarily, so many of these non, uh, these threats are the result of actions by non-state actors, uh, both transnational or, uh, or, uh, or, or non-state. So crossing ac across, so it could be actors within one state, but it also could be transnational, so ones that spread across multiple states. But these actors were increasingly important uh, actors on the international stage. And so just focusing on kind of uh, state-based militaries wasn't uh, covering the full range of people and groups that were having an impact on the security landscape. And then human security. So uh, eventually, uh, too, it became increasingly, particularly with many of the new threats and the new actors, but also just with kind of the disappearance of the Cold War. Um, so we could refocus on kind of a, a new landscape. Increasingly, came we seen that just focusing on kind of the security of the state um, wasn't really good enough. Um, if the state's supposed to be, uh, you know, the, the primary goal of state is supposed to be kind of securing its people. Um, so if, when we're talking about security, really, we should be look, thinking also about the security of people or human security. Uh, so there was a new focus on security of individuals and groups within states, not just the states themselves, right? So even if you have a state that itself seems relatively secure, but its people within the state are not secure, it's hard to say that we really have a, a strong security situation. Um, and so these kind of allowed for redefinition where things like environmental security, human security, biosecurity could come on to the, uh, uh, it could come into the conversations. Uh, certainly the rise of terrorism, um, uh, particularly in, in the 90s, but particularly in the early 2000s, also would have changed this landscape. 
um, where non-state actors uh, became uh, inc really, really important in the security discourse. Terrorism aren't your traditional kind of weapon-wielding militaries uh, carrying out conventional attacks. Um, so these are the changes that made it possible. Uh, so uh, what uh, what put kind of biosecurity itself onto the map rather than just kind of a change of security? Um, so what put biosecurity as a threat uh, or, um, or made uh, kind of us, us realize that biosecurity is a threat and what are the source of this threat? So advance, advances in biotechnology and life sciences. So, so the skills, materials, and technologies to conduct civilian activities such as biomedical research and pharmaceutical production can also be used to produce biological weapons. Uh, molecular biology, synthetic biology, bioregulators, and advanced biotechnologies provide numerous ways to modify organism, organisms to be more virulent, resistant to antibiotics and vaccines, and better, better able to avoid detection and diagnostic systems. Right, so it's, there's more and more people who have the skills and materials and technology to conduct uh, biological research. It also means that these people um, have the technologies to, you know, we, we, we're hopeful that all the people who are trained um, or have the, these materials and skills uh, and technologies will be uh, conducting research for kind of, you know, the betterment of society, right? But as more and more people uh, have access to, this, um, you know, the, the capacity to do biological research, it also means that there's more and more people who have the capacity to um, try to weaponize um, biological agents. So it, if it used to be that, you know, there's a relatively small number of people working in government labs who could, uh, uh, or kind of Western universities could uh, do these things, well then kind of the threat of any of them going rogue, so to speak, um, was, was minimal as these technologies spread, as the skills uh, spread, as there's just more and more people and we're working in more and more labs, there's increasing threat that, you know, people can go rogue. Uh, there's also just the possibility, you know, that uh, uh, development of resistant uh, strains that are resistant um, could even be done uh, through research that's not meant to be nefarious or meant to cause harm. Uh, it, but even kind of research that has the, the best goals can sometimes create um, new strains um, that, uh, you know, with unintended consequences. Uh, new diseases. So not only do we have more people working in kind of biotechnology, but we've also seen the rise of new diseases. And so that's kind of helped increase uh, threat. So since 1973, more than 30 previously unknown infectious disease, uh, disease agents, such as HIV, Ebola, and SARS, now we can add Corona or COVID-19, um, have been identified, because SARS technically is a coronavirus. Um, so COVID-19 have been identified. At least 20 more well-known diseases, such as malaria, tuberculosis, and cholera, have reemerged and or spread geographically since that time, um, often in more lethal and drug-resistant forms. So the rise in these emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases is a result of a complex interaction between genetic bio uh, and biological factors, environmental and ecological factors, and social political and economic factors. So we'll unpack a few of these um, in later slides. Um, but it's important to note that we, we have seen like many of the diseases that we talk about most. Uh, so, you know, uh, HIV, which um, is a relatively recent disease. Ebola, which uh, in, you know, the last 10 years, there was that outbreak that caused a lot of concern. It's a relatively recent disease. Um, SARS was in the 2000s, COVID-19 uh, COVID or emerging you know, 2019. Um, so many of these new diseases um, can cause uh, tremendous threat. Uh, and then we've seen for a variety of different reasons, some, you know, related to decrease in vaccine, uh, vaccine, uh, uh, vaccines, um, but also others related to um, a whole plethora of other issues. I've seen diseases that, you know, used to be controlled um, or even completely gone from a region um, re-emerging. Uh, so you're even seeing that to a certain extent with, you know, North America with seeing increased numbers of measles coming back, uh, which, you know, used to be extraordinarily rare, but with decreases in vaccine, uh, vaccination uh, levels, uh, we're seeing uh, uh, vaccine 
vaccination levels, we're seeing uh, kind of a reemergence. Globalization. Um, so globalization has uh, increased um, kind of the threat or, or the biosecurity uh, threat um, through multiple pathways. So uh, first, biological weapons. So the globalization of pharmaceutical and biotechnology industries and the fusion of information about the life sciences are making the ingredients necessary to develop biological weapons, knowledge, expertise, and equipment and materials more widely available. So that's similar to the point that we talked about before where you have more and more people who have skills in biotechnology. Um, well, these people well, with skills in biotechnology aren't located just in one region, they're spread across the, uh, the globe. Um, so. Uh, it's now, it's less of kind of a localized you know, uh, industry, it's now more of a global industry. Um, and so uh, biological weapons, which, you know, at one time would have been only a small number of countries or a small number of countries would have, ac have access to, now it, it's not terribly difficult to have people who have the skill set uh, or the technology to be able to create bioweapons. So it's a more accessible program for certainly countries and um, there's the worry, um, non-state actors as well. Um, agriculture. So uh, part of, a, uh, of the globalized world is um, that we get our food products, uh, our agricultural products from uh, multiple countries. So reduction in trade barriers and transportation costs have led to the creation of a global agricultural supply chain that has introduced more pathways for pathogens to cross borders and cause foodborne illnesses. So if it used to be that you got all of your food um, from kind of local sources, or at least from national sources, even if there was a foodborne illness that emerged in you know one part of the world, it stayed localized to that one part of the world. It, it wouldn't spread to others because the uh, agricultural supply chain was relatively restrained. Now as we're dealing with the global agricultural supply chain, um, if there's a foodborne uh, pathogen that, uh, uh, that, that emerges in one part of the world, it's likely to quite quickly spread to many other parts of the world. Um, travel. Um, so the growth in international travel, tourism, and immigration also increase the risk that a local outbreak will affect multiple countries. Um, so, um, similar to agriculture, where it used to be that, you know, people stayed uh, relatively local, um, even if they took trips, they didn't travel halfway around the world because it took a lot of time, a lot of money. Um, now, as that we, we have, for uh, because travel has become so much easier uh, and cheaper and faster, um, you have for work, for immigration, for tourism, you've got so much more travel. Um, which means that if an outbreak happens in one location, it's going to very quickly spread to other locations. So in uh, 2009, the H1N1 influenza pandemic spread as far into six weeks as previous pandemics had spread in six months. So showing just how quickly uh, viruses can spread. Um, by um, today's day, so May 11, uh, 2020, there have been more than 4 million confirmed cases of uh, COVID-19. Um, so yeah, that should say, I forgot to write in the disease name, but of uh, COVID-19, uh, so 4 million cases, confirmed cases of COVID-19, 283,779 deaths, and at least 10,000 cases in 44 countries. So, you know, this virus emerged, we, we don't know an exact date, um, but emerged locally in, uh, in China in uh, 2019, and by, you know, still in the first half of 2020, we've had over 4 million confirmed cases spreading to pretty almost um, every country in the world, at least 10,000 cases. So, you know, substantial number of cases in at least 44 countries um, and approaching 10,000 and many, many others. Um, and 283,779 deaths. And the spread's nowhere near done. And it's just how quickly the virus spread once it started leaving China, how quickly within, you know, just months, um, uh, or to be honest, even weeks, it had you know taken root in so many different countries. Um, shows how through travel um, the disease can spread uh, globally. Uh, changing nature of conflict. So changes in the way that uh, conflict occurs also makes biosecurity uh, a growing uh, threat. 
So first is civil wars uh, becoming more and more uh, prevalent. Um, and civil wars uh, ha tend to have uh, major negative effects on uh, uh, on uh, on kind of health and disease spread. So modern armies fall by eliminated disease as a major cause of casualties. Um, so they don't tend to use biological weapons, uh, diseases treated among soldiers. One of the, the more pernicious effects associated with internal conflict is the spread of infectious diseases. So infectious diseases such as HIV AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, and other respiratory diseases are the primary causes of civilian deaths and disabilities uh, generated by civil war. Um, and it's not that civil armies and civil war are intentionally spreading these diseases. It's more that internal conflicts facilitate disease outbreaks by destroying a nation's medical and public health infrastructure, generating large volumes of displaced persons who lack um, adequate food, shelter, sanitation, and medical care, and by impeding a system by international public health and humanitarian organizations. So you've got kind of three uh, inter uh, linked problems. So you've got uh, a healthcare industry that's decimated, a local healthcare industry that's decimated um, by the Civil War. So destruction of property, killing of the people working uh, in it, uh, just diminish government capacity to just manage it, uh, manage the healthcare system. Um, so that means that people who get sick are less able to get care. Um, you've got a large number of internally displaced people, say, um, uh, clumped uh, into very high density uh, refugee camps, um, often without proper nutrition and sanitation and medical care, which um, often makes refugee camps uh, uh, very, e it's very easy for disease to spread within uh, many of these kind of refugee camps. Uh, and then finally, uh, it's often difficult in civil war for international public health and humanitarian organizations um, to get access to the people who need help. So there's no local help. It's difficult for inter international help to come in. And by um, having people be displaced to places with um, that lack ad adequate uh, food and nutrition, uh, adequate shelter and adequate sanitation and medical care um, have um, growing kind of spread of diseases. So civil wars um, make kind of the spread of disease more likely. Um, there's also the worry that uh, uh, terrorists would try to use uh, biological weapons or any of the kind of nuclear biological or chemical, so the weapons of mass destruction that terrorist groups would uh, try to use them to cause mass casualties uh, and, and, and mass fear. Um, this threat emerged as a major security issue in the mid-1990s after the Japanese cult uh, tried to obtain nuclear biological weapons and use sarin nerve gas to attack the Tokyo uh, subway system. So we started to really think that this was a major threat and there's always, you know, it's always a major security concern that one of the larger, particularly one of the larger terrorist groups will try to acquire nuclear, bio, or chemical weapons. Um, in fact, it, that there isn't much evidence that most of them have actually tried. Um, some research has even suggested that most of these groups, wouldn't, most of at least the more mainstream ones, wouldn't even want them, given the stigmas associated um, with them. Um, and despite the spread of uh, nuclear or nuclear biological and chemical scientists throughout the world and technologies and stuff like that, um, it still would be relatively difficult to acquire them to say, not to get a strain of a virus, but to properly weaponize it into a way to make it into a bioweapon would still be relatively difficult for most terrorist organizations. So while if any terrorist group tried to, or succeeded in doing it, um, it could be a major problem. Um, I don't want to overstate. Uh, so it's certainly possible that one could uh, have access, particularly in the bio or, or chemical areas, um, be able to develop uh, either biological or chemical agents. Uh, so weaponize a virus or develop a chemical weapon like, uh, like sarin gas. Um, but um, whether the, the likelihood of any terrorist organization having kind of the the joint 
um, capacity and desire to acquire these weapons, um, and then the ability to use them um, is, is relatively low. So I don't want to over, it's, it's a possibility. Um, it would be catastrophic if it occurred or could be catastrophic if it occurred. Um, but I don't want to spread too much fear in it that it's not also the most likely scenario. So here's kind of a taxonomy of biological threats. So kind of looking at kind of what are the different threats that exist based on what, what's the source of the threat and what's the at-risk group. So who is this kind of targeting um, and where is it coming from? So let's start in cell one with states kind of targeting states. So it's a, the threat comes from states and the at-risk group is the state. So even if an at-risk group is a state, it doesn't mean it, does, um, it doesn't also kill individuals or the community, but it also, you know, kind of the primary goal is weakening of the state. So it's kind of like a state level security issue. So in kind of source of, in the state, state box, we have biological warfare. So for example, Soviet or Iraqi biological weapon programs, where kind of the bioweapons are intended to be used in interstate war. Uh, and there are several countries, there are biological weapons conventions that are supposed to make biological weapons illegal, but there certainly are some countries uh, who would have stockpiles of bioweapons. Um, but it's not a weapon that even countries that have, uh, have them have typically resorted to. Uh, continuing source of threat state, um, but this time the target being individuals. So this would be biological warfare, um, but ones that could be used um, less against, say, an interstate war, but more against certain segments of the population. So it's a you know, state-controlled uh, bioweapon, but they could potentially be used against the population. Um, again, this is possible, um, but it's more likely that the government, if it wanted to use uh, an agent uh, against it, people would resort to chemical weapons where you can control the dispersal more. Um, Bioweapons, part of the reason that they're not particularly effective for both um, cell one and cell two, so in interstate war and kind of in uh, on segments of the population, um, it's, it's twofold. One, um, it kills quite slowly, um, or often kills quite slowly, or at least relative to other weapons, which makes it particularly um, can be not useful in interstate war, particularly at, at the tactical level. So using you know, on an imposing army that you're about to be facing, yes, if you can make them sick, they're less effective in fighting, but um, it's not gonna be kind of incapacitating them fully terribly quickly. Um, the second is things like dispersal in a way where you're not gonna be affecting your own people. So. Um, yes, a state could use it and use a bioweapon on another state city, but again, I'm using it on kind of an opposing army that's just across the field from your own. If the wind patterns change, you don't know if the bioweapons can end up affect, infecting your own soldiers. Uh, or here too, if you get an outbreak of a disease within your country, it could easily spread from one group to another group. So from the desired target to um, a, a group that you don't want to be targeting. Uh, so that makes biological weapons, you know, it's possible that they could be used, they've been developed, but they're not the ideal weapon for those purposes. Um, so second is non-state actors, um, and they could either be targeting the state or individuals, community, or society. So the at-risk group, uh, so non-state actors as the source of threat where the at-risk group is state, so we've got two. So you've got biological terrorism, uh, so kind of a, uh, any terrorist group, so the, this was the Japanese one or Al-Qaeda, um, any terrorist group that tries to use a, uh, a biological agent in, in terrorism. Um, this is a threat, but again, I don't want to overstate it in that kind of, well, it's readily available, technology and the personnel. It's still not the easiest thing to develop to weaponize an agent, so you need a terrorist group that A, desires it, so that cares, so in the sarin attack in Japan, this was kind of a millenarian group that kind of saw the end of the world coming, right? So they weren't necessarily thinking about recruiting for the long term because um, they saw the world coming. Um, given the stigma associated with biochemical and nuclear weapons, 
uh, this, you know, the use of it would have to be restricted to groups that are really on thinking about the destructive side and recruiting the most extreme members to the group because you're going to alienate even many members of your own group, uh, particularly moderates, because of the kind of norm breaking element of using them. So um, you need a group that is strong enough to get them, uh, that has the ability to get them that wants them, and then that's able to pull off the attack. Um, dual use uh, research. Um, so here kind of the risk is that um, many of the kind of um, genetic engineering or synthetic biology um, things that we develop, technologies that we develop for one purpose can often be used for another purpose. So uh, say something that's made, technology that's developed to produce cures can probably be reworked to produce a new virulent agent uh, accidentally or uh, on purpose. Um, so someone who's trained in that technology could repurpose it to something uh, negative uh, that could target the state. And then non-state actors uh, targeting individuals, community, or society. So you have biocrimes. Uh, so ones where it's it, not necessarily terrorism, it's more, say, organized crime or criminal elements targeting individuals. Uh, so not for the purpose of threat, but because um, they want to target that individual as, as part of a crime. Uh, so for example, using toxin from a puffer fish to kill someone, um, say, uh, from a rival gang or something like that. Uh, then there's uh, threat to community, so of laboratory ac uh, accidents. So at biological um, labs, if there were to be an accident, it's probably not going to harm the entire state, but it could certainly harm individuals in the community around the, uh, the lab. And then finally, nature. Uh, nature um, can target both kind of individual communities or, or the state if it becomes uh, large enough. So pandemics. So things like uh, HIV AIDS, uh, pandemic influenza, uh, now uh, COVID-19, which has reached the, a pandemic stage, right, could come up, cause tremendous damage to the state themselves. So some of the worst states by, for HIV AIDS, right, they've had to spend tremendous amounts of money in managing and tremendous amounts of money that often they don't have in managing the HIV AIDS crisis. Um, it's uh, put millions of children into orphanages. It's uh, removed a tremendous number of people from the economy. Um, so it's caused tremendous damage to certain states. Uh, if we look at, say, COVID-19, probably now it's the at-risk group for states. It's not going to, say, destroy any state in the long term, but the amount of damage that it's causing to uh, states around the world, particularly those with, you know, with involved in kind of near total economic shutdowns, massive growth and unemployment. So this goes beyond just targeting kind of individual community, but, you know, very states, uh, the security of, you know, entire states has been harmed uh, with the kind of just slowdown of uh, their economies and uh, everything like that. And then at this more, the smaller scale, we would have uh, endemic and epidemic diseases. Um, so ones that don't uh, re reach kind of the pandemic, so in terms of kind of uh, magnitude of outbreak and geographic spread. So oftentimes, the uh, one of the major differences is often between kind of epidemic and pandemic is not only number of cases, but also geographic spread. Um, and so once these, um, you know, will still be tremendously costly, but not come to the level of damaging the state too much itself, but it can cause uh, tremendous damage or uh, put at risk individuals, community or society within more kind of geographically restrained um, areas. So for SARS, for example, uh, it affected communities, not necessarily globally, but certainly did affect communities where you saw um, large outbreaks. Uh, West Nile virus isn't going to be targeting everyone, but can cause tremendous damage to individuals, community, or society um, within those that have severe outbreaks um, of West Nile virus. 
um, but it's not something that's going to spread uh, globally. Or, I mean, something like even SARS, right, um, didn't have kind of the, the virulence, uh, or not a virulence, I don't think it was the right word, the um, didn't spread sufficiently easily um, for it to, uh, to really reach the pandemic level. It was easy, uh, well, it was tremendously costly and uh, had, uh, was, you know, uh, quite lethal. Um, it was much easier, say, than a COVID-19 uh, to contain. And so this, this is a, a good way uh, of kind of thinking about when you're dealing with things like biological threats or other threats, right? A table like this is interesting thinking about that um, threats can come from multiple sources, and in this case, nature, right? So diseases could be created by non-state actors and come out, but diseases also often just come because they evolve within nature. Um, and then they spread easier because of globalization and uh, stuff like that, but they actually are created just through kind of the process of disease mutations, um, which is fully natural to actions of non-state actors um, and states, but also that at-risk groups can, uh, can differ, right? Sometimes it's a threat to um, kind of the entire nation state, so kind of the national security, um, but sometimes it's more focused at kind of the individual community or society. All right, so that's it for the uh, lecture on biosecurity. So I hope that uh, you have a great rest of the day.